Hello again. Welcome back to the course Life of Christ. We're now in class 49, which is a two-part class based on Matthew 24 and 25, where Jesus talks about the signs of the end. Uh, and so we'll take this in two parts. The first part, we'll talk more about the signs themselves. In the second part, we'll talk about the parables that illustrate the signs and that teaching in Matthew 25. So let's go to Matthew 24, verse 1, and we're going to read uh, a large part of this chapter. Once again, I recommend to you the video on Matthew uh, by Visual Bible. I think you would enjoy that. It really helps illustrate uh, this story well. Beginning in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the stress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. 
Two men will be in the fields, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he be begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. So uh, many different warnings and signs given to Jesus about this time. Let's get a little background here. Uh, the story begins by saying that Jesus went out of the temple with his disciples. This is just after uh, the dressing down of the Pharisees in Matthew 23. So he goes out of the temple and the disciples notice everything that's so wonderful and beautiful in the temple. And that's when Jesus says, this will all be destroyed. And says he goes out to the Mount of Olives and sits down on the Mount of Olives and talks about these things with the disciples. And so here we are on the Mount of Olives in this picture, looking toward uh, the temple courts, so what it would have been the temple courts in Jesus' day, so similar to the view he might have had. Um, and uh, again, if you look at some of the things about uh, the destruction of the temple, uh, you see this model again of Jerusalem in Jesus' time. And the area that we're looking at, here's the temple right here, okay? And then you have all of the temple complex, all the courts surrounding the temple itself. Uh, and what Jesus says is that not one stone will be left on top of another, uh, the, uh, another of the temple. And so that happens. Uh, the temple here, all of this area, was completely destroyed, and they didn't find any stones one on top of another of the temple. In fact, the only thing that really remains of the temple complex is uh, the some of this pavement here, uh, which Herod the Great built, some of the pavement on the Temple Mount, that's still there and you can walk on it. And then some of the retaining walls uh, on this side, all really all the way around. Uh, and then the famous Wailing Wall or the Western Wall of the Jews is right over uh, behind this wall right here. In fact, it's the bottom part of this colonnaded wall right here, okay? That's where the Wailing Wall is that the Jews go to in the Jewish quarter, okay? Now, uh, one area that we're gonna be looking at is this southwest corner of the temple complex uh, because uh, we found some things from uh, that area uh, in some of the ruins and excavations. Um, here is, uh, again, uh, the model uh, of Jerusalem from this uh, southwest side. And here's that corner we we're talking about here. And this was actually the corner that they called perhaps the pinnacle of the temple, maybe the one mentioned in the temptations of Jesus. Um, and this is also the place where they think a priest would stand with a trumpet, a shofar, to announce the sacrifices or the special feast days of the Jews. And he would stand up on a special place in this corner uh, like this, uh, and he would announce it, and everybody could hear that shofar, that trumpet, um, in all the region, all the temple for sure, and then all the, the city of Jerusalem. And you notice right here, in this, this kind of artist rendering of it, there's some Hebrew lettering that talks about to the place of the trumpeter. If you go on down, this is what it looks like today. Here's that same southwest corner, uh, although it's not exactly the same. And then you see bits and pieces of what's left. You see a part of an arch right here. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. And then you see part of a first century street down here. And so they've excavated and they, they know that that is from the time of Jesus there. And then they found this stone, which was that cornerstone with the Hebrew writing on it that talks about to the trumpeter, right? The place of the trumpeter. Uh, they found it when they excavated. In fact, uh, this is the scene 
uh, down at the bottom of that wall, you see the Herodian stones that Herod the Great put up here. Uh, and then this guy is standing near the trumpeting stone where they found uh, right down there at the bottom. This is back in the, the 60s. Uh, and then if you notice, uh, here was the, you know, the southwest corner where that stone was. If you notice this arch underneath it uh, was actually supporting this little staircase that went out of the western side of the temple. And they've uh, found that arch. It's called Robinson's Arch for the guy that found it again. Uh, and if you go and look at it, here's what it looks like today. Uh, just barely a piece of it coming out of the wall. And then if you look a little bit to the left and get a different perspective, then that's what it looks like in the context of the street. And this street down here is a first century street. You see the backs of some windows here that used to be stores, shops along the street. And then if you go down on the street level itself, uh, the arch is just off the top right of this picture. And here are some of the stones that the Romans pushed down from the top of the Temple Mount when they destroyed uh, the Temple Mount in AD 70, along with the rest of Jerusalem. And so uh, those stones are still there where they found them 2,000 years ago. Uh, and then this street here is the first century street, uh, almost certain that Jesus and his disciples, along with many others, walked along this street and uh, maybe made purchases in these shops right here, along here. So that's kind of neat to, to see all that. Um, now let's go back to the text and talk about some of the details in the text about the signs of the end. Uh, the question is the end of what, right? Uh, there's two possibilities. One is uh, the end as in the end of Jerusalem as a city in AD 70 with the Roman destruction, or is it the end of the world, right? The end of time uh, where the final judgment is coming soon. And so if you look back in the text, uh, you go to verse 15, uh, for example, in chapter 24, it says, when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. Okay, uh, that could be a reference to uh, what had happened before uh, when the temple had been desecrated, perhaps by a pig brought into it by Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Um, it could refer to that, uh, and maybe the Romans would do something similar uh, when they came and destroyed. So that seems to be maybe more about an invasion there. If you go on down to uh, verse 20, for example, uh, it talks about uh, that your flight won't take place in winter or on the Sabbath. And if that were talking about the end of the world, it wouldn't matter because the world would be over. It wouldn't matter if it was winter or a Sabbath. And so uh, if it's the destruction of Jerusalem, then it would matter uh, because then you have to get out of Jerusalem, get away, and that would make it harder uh, if it were winter, for example. OK, uh, and then uh, you have down in verse 34, it says um, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. OK, and the word for generation there in Greek is Kenea, G-E-N-E-A. And usually it means like generation of people, like maybe a 20 or a 40 year period. And so if Jesus is speaking in about. Uh, you know, 30, 35 A.D. or so, uh, and the generation is 40 years, okay, uh, then that would be 75 A.D. when that generation would pass away or give way to the next generation. And so if you read it in that way, then it probably refers to the destruction of Jerusalem, okay? Um, and so uh, you, you look at those three verses, and those seem to be more signs that Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and not the end of the world, okay? Now, if you go on and look at other uh, passages there in this same chapter, uh, the ends, uh, that the signs of the end are the end of the world, okay? Uh, there's other tips as well. Uh, in Back in verse 14, remember the verse we read earlier, uh, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, okay? And so uh, the end there seems to be referring to the end of the world, because we know that by 70 AD, that had not happened. The gospel had not been preached to the whole world. Uh, and so uh, that seems to be more uh, about uh, the end of the world. Okay. Then you also have uh, verses 27 uh, through 31, for example, uh, that talk about, uh, let's go down here, um, the lightning 
uh, coming from the east to the west is the coming of the Son of Man. It talks about the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from the sky, a heavenly body shaken, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Uh, and they'll see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then his angels will come with a loud trumpet call. He'll gather his elect. Uh, all of those things <laughs> have not happened yet. And so that also seems to be talking about the end of time and not just the end of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Um, and then uh, the trumpet call, uh, you know, seems to be kind of like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 about there will be a trumpet call and all these things will happen in a flash. And we know there hasn't been that kind of a trumpet call for the whole world and we haven't seen the angels coming, uh, the elects haven't been gathered. And so again, uh, that also seems to be uh, talking more about uh, the end of time, okay? Plus, if you take this word uh, henea, again, uh, for generation, uh, there's another meaning that that can have, not just a generation of 40 years of people, but a generation like a race of people. And so it talks about maybe this race of people will not disappear from the earth until all these things have happened. Well, that could be the end of time because we know that the Jews have not disappeared as a race, for example. Uh, so what's the answer? Uh, which is it, the end of Jerusalem or the end of time? I think it could be one of those passages that includes both, where Jesus is giving hints about both and he's warning people to get ready for both. Uh, the people back in those times, he's warning to get ready uh, for the end of Jerusalem to try to change their ways if they could. Uh, and then just in general to all of the listeners or readers saying, look, you always need to be ready for the end of the world because you don't know when that end is going to come. Um, even the Son of Man doesn't know when the end is going to come. So I think it could be one of those uh, prophetic passages then may have a double fulfillment, maybe, you know, with the Romans in 70, and then also perhaps later at the end of time. Now, there's one passage here uh, in verses 39 through 41 that in some circles of the faith is taken as describing what's called the rapture. Uh, you probably have heard this term, but if not, um, the idea of the rapture is, uh, in, in other languages, it also means like, like a kidnapping or a taking, right? And so the idea of the rapture is that at a certain time, God decides uh, that he will come and he will take all the faithful uh, that are in the world. He'll just take them. They'll just disappear instantly, like in the Left Behind series that you may have seen. Uh, and uh, they'll be raptured away. They'll be snatched away by God and just they'll, they'll just be gone. And then the rest of the earth will remain for up to seven years uh, to go through the trials of revelation. Uh, and then after those seven years, then Christ will come, okay? That's one way to read uh, this passage in 39 through 41. Uh, there's also a little bit of reference to some revelation passages. Uh, to 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Uh, they look back at Ezekiel and Daniel for some things. Um, and that's one interpretation of this passage. I can't say that it's totally wrong uh, because uh, God could do it that way. Uh, but I do think there are some weaknesses uh, with that idea of the rapture. OK, um, I would think that if I'm reading this passage, it would be better to understand it in the context of the last coming of Jesus in which the faith will be taken up to heaven and then the wicked will be sent to hell. That'd be more how I would read it. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why in just a minute. Uh, but that is one of the interpretations off of this section. Then uh, I wanted to mention some terms. For example, uh, the term millennium uh, is often used when describing the, the end time events uh, like some evangelicals talk about. And the millennium refers to the thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. Uh, if you have millennial, it's not just a certain generation uh, of, uh, of people. <laughs> is talking about the thousand year period, okay? Um, and then uh, you have Christ's coming, and that's the event which, you know, pre, post, or of refers to when you talk about millennial, when you stick those, those uh, prefixes onto millennial. And so, for example, the pre-millennialists believe that Christ will come before the thousand years, before the millennium. The post-millennialists believe that Christ will come 
after the millennium. And then the group called the Ah uh, Millennialists uh, think that there's not a literal thousand year period, but rather that it's symbolic. It's not really an actual time period, okay? That it's just like there's going to be a period of time uh, which, you know, God will decide when it happens and he'll manage all of that, but it's not a literal thousand years on the earth, okay? So if you took uh, some of these terms and you looked at the timeline for pre-millennialists, the ones who think Christ will come back before the millennium, here's kind of how it plays out for them. Uh, they say we are in the last days, and I'm, I do believe we are in the last days. You know, Paul says that too, even 2,000 years ago. Uh, they believe that the rapture will come uh, then uh, at some point pretty soon. Uh, then the seven years of the great tribulation will happen, and they take Revelation 6 through 18 pretty literally, okay? And the Antichrist will reign during the seven years of tribulation. And then Christ will come, uh, and the battle of Armageddon will come, and they base that on Revelation 19 and on parts of Matthew 24. Uh, and then they'll have the millennium, the thousand-year reign, uh, based on, again, Revelation, not apocalypse there. Uh, and then the final judgment will come after the millennium. Uh, and then the new heaven will come down to earth and will reign with Christ. That says uh, God will live among his people. That's kind of the timeline. And if you want a, a visual look at it on a timeline, here's kind of what that looks like. So if you want to pause the video and study that more, you can. And there's a lot more information about this on the internet and different commentaries uh, if you want to find out more about it. But that's the basic position of pre-millennialism. Now, if you're an amillennialist, if you think it's just symbolic and not necessarily literal, then how do you see the end times and end events happening? Here's kind of what they think, that we'll be living along just like normal, just like Noah was, uh, like Jesus said, uh, and that uh, Jesus will come back. OK, uh, and when he does, then uh, all the dead will rise. Uh, everybody who's ever been dead, uh, as mentioned in First Thessalonians four. And then after this, uh, the believers then will be transformed, glorified. Paul talks about that in First Corinthians in a in a flash, the twinkle of an eye, it says. Uh, and then the rapture, the taking up to heaven of all believers now occurs. Um, and then the final judgment will come uh, with the believers and the non-believers. Uh, and then the new heaven and earth uh, will come together. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll spend eternity. Okay. Uh, of the two, uh, I tend to favor this one a little bit more. It seems to be a little bit more biblical. And again, if you want to look at this timeline more, you can pause the video. Uh, this is a little simpler. Um, and it seems to reflect more of what the Bible uh, teaches as I understand it. And I realize uh, I'm not the only expert for sure, not even an expert sometimes. Uh, some of the problems that I see with the millennial position um, is that when you take all of Revelation literally, I think that can get you in trouble, okay? Because not all of Revelation uh, is literal. I think some of it at least is symbolic and some may be literal as well. It's probably some of both uh, in general. Uh, also, if you look at uh, the, the order of Matthew 24, it seems to be that uh, the, end, the order of events will be uh, the end uh, time events will come, Jesus will come, and then everything will end. Okay, it doesn't seem like uh, there's a rapture in a thousand years and a waiting period. Uh, it seems like, you know, we're living, we're living, we're living, and then Jesus comes and that's, that's it. Then it's judgment and the end. Okay, so that emphasizes even more uh, the need to be prepared if that's the way it's going to end. Uh, the parables of Matthew 25 that are right after Matthew 24, in fact, obviously there's no chapter divisions. And so uh, you take 24 and 25 together as part of the same discourse. So Jesus talks about the end time events in 24, and then he tells three parables that we'll look at in the next part of the class uh, about the end times. And in those parables, the idea seems to be that life as normal goes on and then, boom, it's over. Uh, and everything is decided right then without a long thousand year period. And then uh, if you take the idea of a rapture seriously, I think it can create in people uh, kind of a, maybe a laziness or a lack of urgency 
Because if you accept that, if you're not a Christian, or if you're a Christian but really not living like you should at all, then there's a tendency to sit back and say, well, okay, then I'll wait till I see the rapture. Uh, and once I see all those people disappear, then I'll get serious about it and I'll repent and I'll convert or I'll get my act together again if I'm a Christian already. Uh, and then I'll still be safe. That way I can do what I want right now. And then I can change when I see the rapture happen. Okay. And so I think it's kind of a, a false a sense of, of peace or false comfort. Uh, and if you believe that, and that's not the way it happens, uh, then you're really in bad shape, right? So uh, I think our attitude in general should be, first of all, God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't know what he's going to do. It says, you know, that even the sun and the angels don't know when this is going to happen. Uh, and so God is going to do this when he wants and how he wants. He's not going to ask my permission. <laughs> he's not going to, you know, seek my agreement on how to do it. Uh, he's just going to do what he wants when he wants to do it. Uh, and so no matter really what we believe about this, whether we believe the rapture and it's right, or whether we believe that it's not a rapture, whether that's right, it doesn't matter what we believe about it. It's going to happen the way God wants it to happen. The only thing we can control is if we're ready for it or not. And so I think our focus should be on getting ready right now, because uh, if he comes this afternoon, then uh, we'd be ready. You know, whether there's a rapture or not, or a thousand years or not, we're ready. And that same thing applies, obviously, if we get sick or if we get killed, you know, today, uh, before any of the end events happen, we need to be ready anyway. And so I think probably uh, that's uh, the best solution. And then if a rapture happens and we're Christians, then we're taken up to heaven and miss all the seven years of trials. And, you know, if the rapture doesn't happen and Jesus comes back and we go straight to heaven, it's the best of all scenarios. So let's be ready. Uh, and then God can do whatever he wants. All right. So that's the first part of Matthew 24, kind of setting up of what some of that meant. Then the second part of this class, we'll talk about Matthew 25 and the parables of the end times.